Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Answers from the Lab, where we share Mayo Clinic knowledge and advancements on the state of testing and science from laboratory leaders and the people who are making it happen behind the scenes. I'm Dr. Bobby Pritt, Interim Chair of the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. With me today is Dr. Bill Maurice, the President and CEO of Mayo Clinic Laboratories. This is our weekly discussion with Dr. Maurice, in which we learn about updates in the field of laboratory medicine and pathology. Hi, Bill. How are you this week? I'm doing great. How are you? Good. Another week, and here we are again. Here we are. Yep. And today we're going to do a little role reversal where I ask more of the yeah. questions. I know, so, and we get to talk about one of my favorite topics, vector-borne diseases. And this yeah. is the time, isn't it, with the vectors? It is, uh, also known as bugs. Um, yep. <laughs> in common parlance. <laughs> I was just in northern Minnesota here this last weekend, and I'm not sure why, but the bugs are, are the, the biting insects are really bad. Really um, bad. Gnats, mosquitoes, mm -hmm. um, you know, the horse flies and biting flies. But the other ones that are really bad are the ticks yeah um you know and and just we took gretzky out for a walk and we were getting bitten and then they, uh, we found a couple of ticks even just walking you could just see them i mean it's just oh, been amazing poor so, little guy yeah so luckily we had an eye out and and for him but um you know but this is it, it brings to mind you know we hear more and more about these illnesses that we can get particularly from ticks and i think part of that's just because there's more ticks right Mm -hmm. There are more ticks. To, uh, well, ticks are expanding their range. So I should, should say that ticks are in areas where they just had not been recently in the past several decades. They are now expanding into many more counties and states across the country. Um, sometimes we have particularly bad years where the numbers of ticks that are out are, are pretty severe. And right now we're seeing that. I hmm. saw a tick on me when I was at the cabin and the mosquitoes were out as well. We were just talking about mosquito-borne diseases um, with like West Nile virus. So it's a concern. I think everyone needs to know when you're going to go outside, if you're going to be at risk for tick bites and mosquito bites, and then you need to be able to take precautions like yeah. wearing insect repellent. Yeah, your ABCs. and My ABCs, so think, yeah. But, uh, and I think that um, it obviously... We, if we talk more about just in general, and I think it's not just our doing the podcast. I think uh, we talk, people just in general seem to be much more aware of tick-borne diseases in particular, I think, because there's more ticks, but that's, there's more to it than that, right? I mean, because there's also more diseases that we're finding. Mm -hmm. And I, I think you actually were instrumental about five, six years ago, seven years ago, I guess now even, mm -hmm. in, in, in identifying one of those, correct? Yeah, so we've actually discovered two novel tick-borne pathogens here at Mayo just within the past decade. And also within the past decade, several other tick-borne pathogens have been discovered around the country. So you're right, it's not just increasing ticks and finding them in places where they weren't before, but now we're discovering more harmful pathogens uh, that can actually be human pathogens, cause human diseases that are transmitted by ticks. So I think the one you're talking about, Bill, is uh, the second recognized cause of Lyme disease in the United States. And that was discovered with my team working in conjunction with our state health departments, local academic institutions, and the CDC. And wow. um, the name of that pathogen is Borrelia maonii. So now widely recognized and uh, available information on the CDC website that this is the second cause of Lyme disease in the United yeah. States. Yeah, and so Lyme disease, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken, is actually named after Lyme, Connecticut, right? Not yes. where it was first identified, not the, not the pathogen. Not the fruit. But yeah, for the fruit, <laughs> that's the why. But could you, so how did you come across this other cause of Lyme disease? Was it a patient that was sick and that we that seemed like they had Lyme disease that no one could figure out or what? Could you, what was the story there? Yeah, so, well, we had a laboratory developed test for the group of organisms, bacteria that cause Lyme disease. So that whole group is called Borrelia burgdorferi sensu latu group kind of a mouthful, and our PCR detected all of them and differentiated the one that we knew about at the time in the U.S., Borrelia burgdorferi sensu strictu, and the ones that you find in Europe. But it was actually a very astute technologist who was running a test on a little 10-year-old boy and noticed an atypical result that didn't align with any of the three 
in this group that caused Lyme disease that we knew about. In fact, we got this atypical result that was clearly positive, but it was right in the middle of these melting temperature peaks of where, where we would expect for the known organisms. So again, clearly uh, positive, something was there, but it was not what we were used to seeing. So she alerted us, we did an investigation, we got the CDC involved, and, and I investigated the patient's story. So yeah, it was a little 10-year-old boy who was from Northern Minnesota, but had spent time in Wisconsin, and he was really quite sick. Um, you know, severe headache and fever and just being very, very sleepy, so much so that his parents really were quite concerned about him. And, um, and he was hospitalized, and they didn't know what he had. They really performed a whole broad array of testing. And one of the things they did is they ordered our lab developed PCR test, and it showed that a typical result. So we were able to make this diagnosis of a novel pathogen and he was treated and it was all good, but it really let us know more about um, the fact that there was this new tick-borne pathogen out there. Wow. Well, first of all, the entire class of organisms sounds like a group of characters from the Mandalorian or something like from a Star yeah. Wars, but from a Star Wars universe. But, um, but in all serious, I mean, it, it causes serious disease. And the story you talk, tell, mm -hmm. tells the importance of innovation, tells yes. the importance of observation that, and the, and the value of our lab staff, the people that are that are in the labs are, we are healthcare professionals, as you've always pointed out, and mm -hmm. we're making really important discoveries for patients. And then most importantly, I mean, that means that he wasn't the, probably the first person that had mm -hmm. this, but there were others with Lyme disease that were just undiagnosed because the testing just wasn't, you know, the, the testing didn't exist. And so we think about COVID as the one example of test didn't exist. Well, there's lots of things that need to continue to happen for us to develop tests for conditions or for pathogens or for a lot of things that, that we, j we continue to gain insights. Well, absolutely, Bill. And in this case, with the second cause of Lyme disease, the good news is that it would be detected by your standard serology test. But the bad news is that the patient's uh, clinical manifestations might be slightly different than you would expect for Lyme disease. So the right test might never be ordered. Uh, so for our patients, we found that only about half of the patients, and there's now been more than 50 cases of Borrelia mayonii, uh, which we named after the Mayo brothers, um, out of those 50 cases that we know of, only about half of them have had a rash. And we think hmm. of the classic bullseye rash yeah, of Lyme yeah. disease that you see in 70 to 80% of patients with classic Lyme disease, but in these patients, you may not have a rash. And so if Lyme disease testing isn't ordered, these patients may be missed altogether. And yet we know from the patients we've seen so far that they do respond well to antibiotics. And if they aren't treated right away, you can get uh, manifestations such as arthritis, joint yeah. pain, and that can persist. So you want to catch these patients early and treat them. So that really, you're right, shows why innovation is important. Having specific tests like the test we have, uh, this laboratory developed Lyme disease PCR for use in these cases where you have a patient perhaps with this atypical presentation um, that really can lead to these new discoveries and have a really important role in clinical care. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it's, uh, yes, I agree completely. It's a really remarkable story. Now, one of the questions that comes to mind is you see the paper, your, the index case, if you will, was mm -hmm. from Northern Minnesota, but we have people listening to this podcast, you know, from all over and Lyme disease, obviously very prevalent in the Northeast as well. Do we know about how, you know, what is there certain parts of the country we, that you only have to worry about this, or does it seem to have the same distribution as, as regular Lyme disease or what we think of as Lyme disease? That's a great question, Bill. The good news for most people in the country is that this does this has a limited geographic range. In fact, it only appears to be in the upper Midwest, specifically Minnesota and Wisconsin, maybe the Dakotas, a uh, little bit into Canada, but not widespread. We've tested over 100,000 patient specimens from patients living in New England with tick tick exposure, have not detected it in any of those patient samples. So it does appear to be isolated. Therefore, for our listeners that might be on the East Coast or the South or any other place in the United States, um, they probably don't need to include this in their differential at this time. 
But yeah, although you never know with as you open the ticks continue to spread, people can do mm -hmm. travel. So and the other thing I think that as you were speaking is it they really and this is more for kind of for us. We were just talking before we got out about chat GPT and all the ways that we communicate electronically. I still think it's really important for those of us in the lab to connect with the providers and the patients and understand, you know, if there's make it easy to facilitate that conversation because mm -hmm. understanding why someone, if someone orders a Lyme PCR and then, and then getting, and you see, and, and they and they call the lab because they expected it to be positive. You might say, you know, just to make sure you get the right test and understand the context because the symptoms that you describe are pretty, you know, they're pretty vague and they're pretty mm -hmm. nonspecific, I should say, protean. And so again, understanding if there's questions, making sure that we're a resource for the patients and the providers to guide them to the, to the right test is really what uh, the point I'm trying to make because mm -hmm. it might not be obvious, right? Um, yes. But if there's someone in the outdoors a lot and they have these symptoms, you might want to think about suggesting that they get a Lyme serology and PCR. Yeah, exactly. And we really are test stewards of the tests. We're the experts on these tests we offer. So we really need to work with our patient facing colleagues that are ordering the test to help them understand which test they should order. So for Lyme disease, if you are suspecting Lyme disease, the serology would be the number one test. But we really recommend for patients that are in the upper Midwest that have an atypical presentation, they could also consider our Lyme disease, PCR. It is available um, to anyone who places orders through Mayo Clinic Laboratories, and it actually is quite good uh, at detecting this Borrelia mayonii, the spirochetes uh, that are the second cause of Lyme disease in the U.S. because the numbers are very high in the blood. And that's very different than Borrelia burgdorferi, the standard cause of Lyme disease, where it's almost never detectable in the blood, or I should say very rarely. So hmm. they, they even behave differently, these two different causes of Lyme disease in the United States. No, no wonder you're so interested in all these things. Really yeah. fascinating. So, yeah. So, great talk to you as always. Yeah, you too, Bell. So, watch out for those ticks. That's yeah. always the advice I give, regardless, is uh, wherever you are in the country, know what tick-borne pathogens you have, and then just take the steps to avoid getting tick bites and mosquito bites because they're out yeah. too. And, and you remember also a couple closing points. Number one. If you are feeling ill and you go to your provider, make sure you talk about your travel history. Yep. I saw a lot of out-of-state plates up and, you know, in, in, in license plates when I was in, up north. And so think about that if you if you get sick. And also please protect your pets. Unfortunately, my yeah. brother-in-law lost his pet to an illness which is endemic in that part, blastomycosis, which is endemic. He didn't tell his vet back in back in southern Minnesota that he'd been up there. So they got they made the diagnosis too late. So oh. think about protecting you. Think about protecting your pets, and, mm -hmm. but still get out there and have fun. Yes, just wear that bug spray. You'll be good. And don't forget the sunscreen too. Exactly. All right, well, until next time. All right, thanks, Phil. Thank you so much for tuning in to Answers from the Lab. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to tune in every Thursday and every other Tuesday. <music>